کنگره ایالات متحده آمریکا کنفرانس درباره قتل عام و گروگانگیری در اشرف تاکید نمایندگان کنگره از هر دو حزب شخصیت های سیاسی و فرماندهان حفاظت اشرف بر تعهد و مسئولیت آمریکا در تأمین حفاظت لیبرتی و وادار کردن حکومت عراق به آزادی گروگانها واشنگتن 9 اکتبر 2013 17 مهر 92 It's hard to even start out. Painful memories. On the night, late night of August 31st, I received a phone call. Camp Ash Ashraf is under attack. And what was set in motion is a long, long night. As my friends, some very personal friends, were being murdered. I have tried to think of all the times Hussein and I have spent together, all the events that we did, all the things that we worked together. And when I thought I had remembered them all, soon another one would come up, and another one after that, and another one after that. And I realized I cannot count and track all the times that Hussein and I worked together. The same for Commander Zura. I don't know how many times we sat in meetings and worked for common solutions. When I look at this attack, knowing every person killed in that attack had been issued a protected person status card. We had promised them. Then in 2009, we abandoned our comrades in the field of battle. The State Department turned them over to the pro-Iranian Maliki government. Beyond belief. Ambassador Jeffries assures Senator McCain that they will be protected by the Maliki government. He says, I am 95% certain. What happened? Just months later, four months later, the first assault, 2009, followed by 2011. And all the time we're fighting to get them off the terrorist list. And I know they're not terrorists. Everybody in this room knows they're not terrorists. And in all honesty, everybody in State Department knew they were not terrorists. But it was politically ex uh, ex uh, advantageous to go ahead and call them terrorists so they could appease the fundamentalist Iranian government. I look at this attack. State Department today is trying to say, oh, this, we, uh, we have no evidence the Iraqi government was involved. Nonsense. The video footage is there. And I'll go through that in a minute. And we're still trying to get State Department to admit the obvious. But then we're still trying to get State Department to admit the obvious on Benghazi, and we know how that's going. So as a result, I don't expect them to have a great awakening over there in Foggy Bottom and suddenly start admitting the truth. So we'll do it for them. When you look at that footage, as the anti-terrorism officer for all coalition forces, as a warrior from uh, the earliest days and uh, even through the other days uh, in Iraq, when I see those soldiers, that SWAT team, wearing the same exact uniform of the Iraqi SWAT team that's shown in the recruiting posters, except they're also wearing face masks and they're carrying silences on their weapons, they're coming over the berm. That berm is north of the main highway, north of Lions Gate, north of Tulip Square, north of Freedom Square. That is the real estate that we controlled as Americans and turned over to the Iraqis. They came straight in from the north. State Department is trying to say there's no evidence that they did that. There's the evidence. And Ashraf was totally, totally surrounded 360 degrees by Iraqi forces. There's no way anybody could come in or leave without engagement of the Iraqi forces. Now, I offer State Department a possible way it could have come in. Maybe they'll snatch up on it. The possible way is Captain Kirk of the Starship Enterprise beamed down the assault force and left them there for two hours while they walked around casually killing people, and then he had Scotty beam them back up. That's science fiction. State Department needs to get away from fiction and start reality, and the reality is 
that was an Iraqi assault. Now, it has been decided that the Iraqi government, Nuri al-Maliki, has told General Jamil to go ahead and launch an investigation. And his deputy shows up at liberty to interview the 42 survivors. In the military, we have a statement, and it's called Stuck on Stupid. What's stuck on stupid is for State Department to accept this as a le legitimate investigation. That equates to the Chicago Police Department going to Al Capone and asking him to investigate the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It is just totally unrealistic that you're going to get an investigation. I have offered to go over and do the investigation. State Department doesn't want me anywhere near the camp. And I've done hundreds of investigations. We had to wait 72 hours for a member of State Department to even go to Ashraf. Attorney General McCasey, the top law enforcement officer of our nation, will tell us, you launch an investigation within the first 24 hours, because by the time 72 hours arrives, your chances of getting a successful investigation is gone. Is that true, Judge? He says, absolutely, and I totally agree. All the shell casings are gone. Everything's gone, and now we're going to have the man who launched the attack, the man who supervised the attack, to investigate it. The nonsense has to come to a conclusion. We have to now go and protect these people. 3,000 more are at Camp Liberty. The survivors were ordered out where there was going to be another attack. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I have some prepared remarks, and then if we have time, I will take some questions. Today, these persons that we promised to protect and left helpless are now in grave danger. Well, we know that uh, some hundred of them are now dead, in fact, in the course of, I think, five separate attacks. The 3,000 persons that we turned over to the Iraqis under the uh, promise of protection some have already been killed by the very persons promised to protect them, as you've seen in the videos, uh, and been killed by who, as, as we've discussed. Um, you can see in this picture the blue truck belongs to Iraqi security forces. The white building belongs to the Mujahideen and was occupied by an Ashrafi on the day of the attack, who was later found dead. And so it is simply unbelievable um, Wes and I, uh, we were responsible for security all around the camp. Once you get outside the perimeter wall, it's all desert, with the exception of the, the structures that have been put up by security forces. It is simply unbelievable that this hours-long attack that included uh, the use of explosives and multiple small arms fire shots was not detected by Iraqi security forces. It's beyond the realm uh, to believe that somehow they weren't connect, complicit in some way. Uh, uh, I think last week, two weeks ago, perhaps, Ms. Wendy Sherman, the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, was testifying in front of the Senate Committee for Foreign Relations. She said that she shared her deep concern over the attack that left 52 people dead, most of them executed at close range by coup de grace. She sought to reassure the senators that the refugees were safe because now sandbags had been provided. So I want you to understand that where they're being held now in the ironically named Camp Liberty, essentially they've been concentrated into a small camp. It does not have T walls for mortar protection. It's surrounded by the same security forces that um, likely perpetrated this attack. Uh, Ms. Sherman utterly fails to understand the fundamental point that the Iraqi government itself, now effectively under Iranian control, is the greatest risk to these people. The Iraqi government is the risk to these people. And so looking to the Iraqi government to provide protection is worse than meaningless. It's an abdication of American responsibility. 
our responsibility is clear. There is no moral gray area here. As Secretary Kerry said so powerfully on April 19th, part of the American spirit is the fierce belief in the dignity and potential of every single person. Part of American leadership is speaking out for people who can't speak out for themselves. It's also standing up for those who fight for their own rights. As I said, sometimes in the most desolate places without support, it is our effort to stand up for the universal rights of all people. History is watching what we do. The 3,000 people in this place, their lives depend on us. It is clearly not something we can leave to the Iraqi government. Thank you. And what I want to leave you with is that foreign policy, the decisions that we make here in Washington, the decisions that we make here in this Congress, have human consequences. We have obligations that we must live up to, and we cannot abdicate our responsibility. There are important public policy steps that we can take next, and we must take them. First and foremost, we must do everything we can to save those individuals, those seven individuals who were taken hostage at Camp Ashraf and who are being allegedly uh, returned uh, to Iran. We must not allow that to happen. We must demand their safe return. Number two, we must do much more than we are to protect the existing residents of Camp Liberty. I look forward to working with you uh, on those endeavors. Uh, and I look forward uh, to taking next steps to protect uh, the very valuable and important lives uh, of the Iranian opposition. Thank you so much for joining us in today's congressional debate.